This is Dr. Michael Trainer. I have created this video to discuss minimally invasive lumbar discectomy surgery. The video is designed to discuss risks and possible complications associated with a lumbar minimally invasive discectomy. In addition, I will discuss frequently asked questions of patients and also uh, discuss instructions and what patients should expect if they are undergoing the minimally invasive lumbar discectomy surgery. The lumbar spine is the lower back and the minimally invasive lumbar discectomy surgery involves a surgery where a small amount of the disc or the cushion between the vertebrae is removed. The small amount of disc that is removed is removed because it is typically compressing or pinching one of the lumbar nerves, which will cause pain from the lower back into the hip or buttock region and then usually radiating down the leg. In addition to pain, patients may also experience other neurologic related symptoms such as numbness or tingling or burning or weakness. Some patients may experience combinations of all of the above. And some patients may not even experience pain, just numbness or tingling or weakness or burning. Typically, patients have been evaluated with x-rays and an MRI scan and oftentimes have already been treated with non-surgical measures prior to moving forward with the minimally invasive lumbar discectomy surgery. In terms of risks of the surgery, the surgery typically involves one level of the lumbar spine. The most common levels are the L5-S1 level, which is the lowest level of the lumbar spine, or the L4-5 level. However, some patients may have the surgery on another level. The first risk of the surgery involves infection. Anytime there's a cut in the skin, a patient has a risk of infection. Because this is a minimally invasive surgery, the incision is typically only about 26 millimeters, which is about an inch or less. Infection is extraordinarily rare with this surgery. In order to prevent infection, the patient will be given IV antibiotics during the surgical procedure. The patient is often given an additional dose of IV antibiotics in the recovery room. The patient does not require at-home antibiotics following the surgery. Blood loss during the surgery is very minimal because of the minimally invasive nature of the surgery. Again, it's a very small incision and typically patients will lose more blood in their preoperative testing than they will in the surgery. So blood loss is not a significant concern. Blood clots are extraordinarily rare after this surgery and therefore no blood thinners or treatments to prevent blood clots are required. One of the risks of the surgery is injury to the lumbar nerves. Typically the surgery is being performed because the nerves are pinched or irritated or injured. In performing the surgery to free the nerves, to remove the disc that's pinching the nerve, there is a risk to the nerves. In order to decrease that risk, the surgery is performed with what's called intraoperative nerve monitoring. What that means is, during the surgery, once the patient is off to sleep under anesthesia, a nerve monitoring technician will place needle probes from the skull all the way to the toes. The needle probes will go in the muscles, in the skull, and again, all the way to the toes. The probes are attached to an apparatus that monitors spinal cord, brain, and nerve function. That way, when I am working around the spinal nerves, I will know if there are any changes or irritation present. If there are, then we can stop what we're doing and check things to make sure that everything is functioning normally. The patients will not fill those probes as they will be placed once they are asleep and they will be removed before they wake up. With that said, there is certainly risk to the nerves. There is minimal risk to the spinal cord during the surgery because the spinal cord ends at the first lumbar vertebrae and as we just discussed, this is typically performed below the first level of the lumbar spine. So paralysis, 
uh, is not something I have ever encountered in performing this surgery over 20 years. But technically we are working around spinal nerves, so we uh, caution patients that uh, the spinal cord is in close proximity to our surgery. The patient will be notified the night before their surgery with regard to the location and time for the patient to present to the facility where the surgery is being performed. The surgery can be performed at the surgery center or at the hospital, but it is expected to be an outpatient procedure, meaning the patient will be allowed to be discharged the day of the procedure. If the patient's surgery is on a Monday, the patient will be notified by one of the office staff on the Friday before the procedure. Otherwise, if the procedure is performed on a Tuesday through Friday, the patient will be notified the night before the procedure. The final surgery schedule is not complete until usually late in the afternoon the day before the surgery, and this is the reason that the call will be later. Patients should not eat or drink anything after midnight the night before the surgery, with the exception of blood pressure medication. If a patient takes blood pressure medication in the morning, they can take that medicine with a sip of water the morning of the surgery. All other medications should not be taken. In addition, the patient should not eat or drink anything after midnight the night before the surgery. This includes gum or certs or lozenges, food or drink of any kind. If the patient does have something to eat or drink, the surgery will likely be canceled. The surgery is performed under general anesthesia so the patient is asleep the entire time. Again, it is a very small incision, but local numbing medicine will also be injected following the procedure. The surgery normally takes about one hour. It may take less time, but it could take more time. I will see the patient the morning of the surgery. At that time, I will mark on their lower back the specific site of the surgery and it is typically right side versus left side, and it's also a specific level, for example, L5-S1. This way, we are always sure that we do not perform surgery on the wrong side, the wrong patient, or the wrong level. I will also obtain contact information for any loved ones or family members, friends, that may be there with the patient uh, so that I can call them after the surgery and uh, report that the patient is doing well. The patient will typically stay in the recovery room for approximately one hour uh, or so following the surgery. At that time, the patient will be uh, mobilized. So we will get the patient up, get the patient walking. The patient should avoid excessive bending, twisting, or lifting greater than 10 pounds. No back braces are required after the surgery but we will make sure that the patient is safe getting up and walking. The patient will be discharged once the patient's pain is adequately controlled with medication they can take by mouth. The patient needs to be able to get up and walk. They need to be able to go up and down a couple of stairs. They need to be able to get in and out of the bed, uh, get on and off the toilet seat. And once they accomplish that, uh, they will be safe for discharge. In addition, we will make sure the patient has no uh, side effects from the anesthetics. If they're nauseous or vomiting, we will take care of that with medications prior to their discharge. The patient will be seen at two weeks following the surgery, sooner if there are any problems. The patient will typically be seen seven to 10 days prior to the surgery for a preoperative visit, and at that visit, all of the aforementioned instructions will be discussed, but the patient will also schedule their two-week follow-up appointment at the preoperative visit. Again, the patient will then be seen at two weeks following the surgery. At that time, the incision will be checked. The sutures will remain in place, and the patient will be seen at three weeks following the surgery to remove the sutures. The patient is allowed to shower the day following the surgery. They can keep their initial dressing on for the first day as it is waterproof and they can shower. The patient should then take the dressing off on the second day and they are allowed to shower and get the sutures wet. 
After the shower, the patient should dry the wound and place a clean, dry dressing. No ointments or salves or bacitration should be placed on the incision, just a clean, dry dressing after the daily shower. Make sure that the wound is nice and dry. Occasionally, patients may have a small amount of drainage from the wound, which is not unexpected. The wound may be a little bit red or a little bit warm. That is also not unexpected and that does not mean there is any infection. With that said, if the patient has any questions, the patient should call the office day or night and we will get back to the patient. If it's after hours or weekend, the paging service will call me and I will call the patient. Do not go to the emergency room. If there are any concerns, please call the office first. If we're in the office, we will see you that day. If we are not in the office, I will call you. And if we need to get you in the office the next day or send you to the emergency room, we will do it, but we will call ahead for you. Although this is extraordinarily rare with this surgery. In terms of activity, Patients can start light cardiovascular activity uh, the day after the surgery, but avoid excessive bending, twisting, or heavy lifting. Again, the patients will be seen at two weeks uh, to check on uh, the incision and their symptoms. They'll be seen at three weeks to remove sutures. At three weeks, they'll often be sent for some physical therapy and they'll be seen at six weeks. Most patients at six weeks are doing extremely well. Last visit is usually at 12 weeks. And by three months, typically patients have no restrictions and they can resume all activities. One additional risk that we did not discuss is some patients could sustain a recurrent disc herniation. That means the disc could re-herniate at some point following the surgery. Uh, that risk is the greatest for the first four to six weeks and for this reason we tell patients to avoid excessive bending, twisting, or lifting for the first several weeks. Unfortunately, as stated previously, some patients may have some residual nerve symptoms or back pain that the surgery does not eliminate. But hopefully the patients will experience the greatest amount of relief uh, with the surgery, uh, especially more relief than they were able to obtain with the non-surgical treatments, as this is typically the reason why the surgery is performed. All of the aforementioned uh, discussion is going to be available uh, for patients to see through our website, which is aosmlv.com. Again, aosmlv.com. And the patients just need to go to the medical team or medical providers. They can click on Dr. Michael Trainer, and then they can look for the video uh, for the minimally invasive lumbar discectomy surgery. Thank you.